seated. <coughs> Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? The gift of water is no small thing. People around the world and throughout history have struggled to find fresh water. The ones with wells, like this one we read about in scripture, are lucky. And those of us who have fresh water pipes straight into our homes are even luckier still. It's a luxury few have had throughout the history of the planet. The Samaritan woman in today's gospel knew she was lucky to have the gift of a well from her ancestor Jacob. And yet retrieving water every day was not an easy task. The well was outside the city. Now, we don't know how far she had to walk, but it was definitely hard work, especially judging by her enthusiastic response to Jesus' offer of a new source of water. One at first she thought was a literal spring of fresh, running water. Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Her excitement over fresh water would be shared by many people, even in our time, and especially by those who carry water every day, who are overwhelmingly women and girls. A humanitarian worker named Becky Straw wrote the following reflection a few years ago while working on a project in rural Uganda. She said, I traveled to some of the most desperate places on earth in search of clean water, and while the landscape changes, there's always one thing that remains the same. The women are always walking. Worldwide, women are more than twice as likely as men to carry drinking water. Becky even describes meeting one particular woman. Helen spent most of her day walking and waiting. She told me each day she'd think to herself, how should I use this water today? Should I water my garden so we can grow food? Should I wash my children's school uniforms? Should I use it to cook a meal? Should we drink this water? With two children, one husband, and only 10 gallons of water, Helen had to make choices. In fact, back to Rogue, you could see the shame on her face when she said that her children were often sent home from school because she did not have enough water to clean their uniforms on a given day. Like Helen, the woman at the well was no stranger to feelings of shame. Not for the same reasons, the Samaritan woman probably did not have children. If she had daughters, they would have joined her on this task of getting water. And if she had grown sons, their wives would have joined her. You see, going to get water for the day was, and still is, a social affair. Not only does that allow for time to catch up, but going together provides protection, safety in numbers. Women would not risk being alone by the well for fear of being attacked. But this particular woman was all by herself at a time of the day when women did not usually go out for water. At noon, the hottest part of the day, when it would have been even harder to carry that heavy jar of water. Normally, women would go out at dawn or dusk, when it was cooler and easier to carry the water. So why is the woman in today's story out at noon, when she finds herself alone and accosted by the stranger? We can conjecture it's because of what Jesus is to reveal later in the conversation, that she's been married five times to five different men, and the one she's with now is not her lawful husband. Because of this, she's like an outcast for community. This is why she's by herself on an errand that's usually done socially. The respectable women of her town want nothing to do with her. Sadly, the church throughout the ages has largely seen this exclusion as justified. The Samaritan woman is often depicted as an immoral woman, whose declaration of faith in Jesus is all the more remarkable because of her past. 
But it's important to remember that women were not free to divorce men in first century Palestine. So her five husbands either died or divorced her, or some combination of the two. So nothing wrong with having had five husbands. Not that there would be anything wrong with that in general, necessarily. But, um, and now, past childbearing years, perhaps she's with a man who she's not married to, not because she's an immoral woman, but because that situation offers her some stability in what would have been a very unstable life situation. You see, in this time and place, women on their own do not have really any ways to support themselves, and so it was a desperate situation. So instead of shunning the woman in the well, Jesus speaks to her. In fact, this is his longest single conversation with an individual recounted in Scripture. As we probably are aware, after having been standing for all that time, we're reading the Gospel. So it's, that's really something, though, that this woman, this woman from Samaria, has the uh, honor and distinction of being the person in the Bible who has the longest conversation with Jesus. By speaking to her, Jesus ignores not only her status as a social outcast, but also the barriers of gender, race, and religion. It was not proper for a respectable Jewish man, a religious leader especially, to speak to a woman in public who was not part of her, uh, who was not part of his family. Thus, his disciples' astonishment when they returned from the city with food, and and then, oh wow, he's speaking to this woman. Added to that, she's a Samaritan a group descended from the same Israelites, same Israelite ancestors as the Jewish people, but now separated by religious practice and by centuries of intermarriage with other nationalities. Jews and Samaritans then felt hostility toward one another. And so the disciples were astonished even more. But they did not question Jesus because they already had learned that he has a different way of doing things. Jesus himself had not only crossed boundaries to reach out to the Samaritan woman, but he also made himself vulnerable in this situation, just as she was vulnerable. When the scene begins today, he's been walking all morning. He's tired, and he's thirsty. And so he says, give me a drink. And the original language, this is more of a plea. Please give me a drink. Then it sounds to our ears uh, in English. He's asking her to look past, also, the barriers that divide them, and recognize their common humanity. Perhaps because she has little to lose, or maybe because she's a person of great hospitality, she defies convention and speaks to this strange man, this enemy of her people. What happens next is that she becomes his follower, and the first non-Jewish evangelist of the Jesus movement. After she goes back to her city to tell people about Jesus, they're interested enough by her tale to go listen to him themselves. When they hear him, they believe. And they tell the woman, for we've heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. Of the world. Notice they don't say Jesus is the Savior of the Samaritans, or even more generously, the Samaritans and the Jews, those who share the common lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, no, they declare that Jesus is the Savior of the world. In fact, Jesus' boundary crossing is part of the work of salvation. Jesus brings healing to the world by breaking barriers that divide us, by helping us to see our common humanity, his divinity, <coughs> is made manifest and making us whole again, both as individuals and as a human family. You remember Helen, the woman from Uganda that Becky Straw met on a humanitarian mission. With the source of clean water in her village, Helen no longer had to be ashamed 
of not being able to do her children's laundry, choosing between that and having enough water to drink and to cook food and to grow food. I'm happy now, Helen being. I have time to eat. My children can go to school, and I can even work in my garden and take a shower and then come back for more water if I want. And she said something else. Now, I am beautiful. Becky was silent. That really hit me. My job, she says, is to focus on sustainable development, health, hygiene, sanitation. But nowhere on any of my surveys or evaluations is there a place to write, today you made someone feel beautiful again. Water changed everything for Helen. The new well saved her hours of hard work and travel each day, allowing her to take better care of herself and her family. Not only did she have an objectively better life, but she felt even more alive than she ever had before. Now, I am beautiful. Now, I am valued. Now, I am a person. A physical well of water has become a spring of living waters. As we follow Jesus in the journey to the cross and the empty tomb, how can we share his abundant life, his springs of living waters with the world around us. Here at Trinity, we're blessed with many ways to nourish people's physical and spiritual needs. For example, if you come to Saturday soup to the community meal, you'll be served good food, but you'll also find good company. It is, after all, a community meal. We always tell volunteers, if you get a chance, sit down and eat the lunch you've been serving with the people you've been serving. Have some conversation. People need food, but they also need connection. We need to be seen. We need to be valued. We need to be recognized as a person, a beautiful person. And that is who we are in God's eyes. As we come here to this altar, to this source, to this fountain, we drink from the springs of living water, and we see ourselves and one another the way God sees us, as God's beautiful children. Amen.